All right, welcome in. Time for our midweek Bible study. We glad you're a part of it, and uh, hope you're having a good week. As we, at least in this part of the country, return to a few days of winter, at least temperatures. Uh, but we're looking forward to the warmer weather on the weekend. Hope you're well. We uh, began a new study last week. We're going to continue uh, in that tonight. <clears throat> we'll be in 1 John chapter 4 here in a moment. Continue uh, what we were uh, discussing last time. So I've always uh, sort of loved watches since I was, I guess, old enough to, to uh, buy my own. And even though it's sort of almost gone out of style, a lot of people don't wear wrist watches. As you can see, I still do. <clears throat> Although I will confess that I rarely look at them for the time, which seems a little ridiculous. Uh, usually, like most people, I glance at my phone to get the time and most other bits of information. But I've always worn a watch. I like the feel of a watch on my arm feel sort of strange without it, and I like the look. Uh, so I guess I wear it for jewelry more than anything else. Um, and maybe a lot of people are like that these days, but I have a small collection of not real expensive watches at home. Although, the reason I bring it up, I did want to mention to you my two Rolex watches. Um, those of you who know what Rolex watches are might... Uh, wonder what's a preacher doing with a Rolex watch, let alone two. I tried to find one of them to bring and show you tonight, um, but I couldn't find them. I think I may have thrown them out. I'm not sure. Maybe they got lost in the move. Obviously, they're not real, if that's the case, because Rolex watches are, are some of the most expensive uh, in the world and the most highly valued um, I bought one of my, um, Rolex watches, uh, Rolex watches in Tijuana, Mexico, uh, when I was in college and on a, a trip to the West coast with my basketball team. Um, we spent New Year's day in Tijuana shopping in their little bargain, uh, bartering shops and, I bought a Rolex watch, a gold Rolex watch, for about $40, believe it or not. Watches that cost 5000 you know. And then the other one, um, I bought someplace on a street in New York City, again on a basketball trip. Um, so obviously neither one of them are real. Rolex watches, though it looks like a Rolex and it has the uh, branding, the name Rolex on it. Um, you can tell uh, when you study watches, when you know uh, what a Rolex is supposed to be like, that these aren't Rolexes. Uh, the, there are several different ways to tell. I don't know all of them, but I know that a true Rolex, the movement of the hand is like a sweeping movement. You don't get this kind of thing with a Rolex, and that's what mine do. And then, obviously, you don't buy Rolexes for $50, uh, like I did. And you don't buy them on the streets of Tijuana, Mexico, or New York City, um, in most cases. You know, from a guy with a, a, a little uh, table set up on the side of the street in New York City. So... Uh, they're not real. Uh, not everything that looks or claims to be real is real. Uh, in, in the Old West, um, they had to learn about fool's gold, something that looked like gold but wasn't. It's actually a, a substance called iron pyrite. Uh, but certainly looked like gold. It, it, it sort of glittered in the sun. And as uh, Shakespeare said long ago, all that glitters is not gold. Same is true with spiritual things. Um, not everything that claims to be spiritual or from God is 
spiritual or from God. And that's why we have um, this text, among others, in the New Testament, 1 John 4. We're talking about testing the spirits. And that's, uh, first of all, different than, than having a testy spirit. We're not promoting testy spirits. Uh, we're not promoting bad attitudes uh, or anything like that. So there's, there's such a thing as a testy spirit, and then there is testing the spirits. One is a bad attitude. The other is a commanded spiritual discipline. And we're thinking about the commanded spiritual discipline of testing the spirits. So let's read again, 1 John chapter 4, first eight verses, and uh, reflect on it a little bit tonight for our study. Again, from the English Standard Version, it, it reads this way, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And then the passage concludes, Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love God does not know God because God is love. So again, uh, recall last, last time we emphasized this command at the beginning of this that says, do not believe. Um, sort of surprising to find that phrase in the Bible when we take it out of context. Uh, a command not to believe. So much of the Bible is encouraging belief, uh, but it's do not believe every spirit. That's the actual command. And then also one thing we didn't uh, point out last week, notice the first, the first uh, word of this passage. He begins by addressing the folks as beloved. Um, the writer again is John. He's sometimes been called the apostle of love. Uh, he speaks about love extensively. And he loved these people. He calls them loved ones, in essence, beloved ones. And so what he commands them to do here was from someone who loved them. It was, a, it was from a place of love. And so it was a loving thing. He was commanding them. And... And as a result, you know, uh, fulfilling or doing what he commanded should be done in love, it should be carried out in love, uh, of course. But um, I, I point this out to, to, to stress that doing what he commanded here is not inherently unloving as some people seem to think. That is to really test the spirits to see if what people are saying is true or not. Some people would say, oh, you're being unkind, you're being unloving because you're challenging what somebody is saying. Uh, that, that should not be the way this is viewed because it comes from uh, a place of love and, and uh, wanting the best for those he was teaching. So with that, let's, let's make a list here of the five tests um, that John gives to help us test the spirits. I think he gives at least five things 
uh, in these eight verses, uh, tests you can apply to any teaching, any teacher, or you know any claim to truth that that comes along that you have questions about. Um, and um, I'm, these are not original with me. I, I think I stressed that last week. A lot of people down through time have noticed these and what John said, and we could find these same these same points other places in the New Testament. Uh, they're just sort of neatly encapsulated here in 1 John 4. So what I want to do is, is list the five and in what verses they, they come to us and then talk about the first one with a little bit more detail uh, to finish out tonight. So here are the five tests, if you want to jot these down or refer to them later, in these eight verses. When John says, test the spirits, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. He then gets specific about how to test them by giving five tests. Number one, test number one is found in verses two and three, and that is, does the, the teaching or the, the teacher or the, the, the claim to truth, whatever you're evaluating, does it teach the true Jesus. Um, and we'll talk more about that in detail here in a moment. But that's in verses 2 and 3. Does it teach the true Jesus? That's test number one in testing spirits. Number two, which can make the list of five first, and then we'll get in um, to the first one. Number two is, is it against worldliness? Does the teaching teacher, the idea, whatever it is, does it, does it uh, stand against worldliness? That's in verses four and five of the text that we read. So again, test number one, does it teach the true Jesus? Number two, is it against worldliness? Test number three is, does it uphold God's word? That's in verse 6, and we'll explain how we get that out of verse 6 when we get to that test. But does it uphold God's word? That's test number 3. Test number 4 in testing the spirits is, does it promote truth? Uh, some of these overlap a little bit, but we'll see how to distinguish them uh, as we get to each one. But that's the second part of of verse six, does it promote truth? Uh, test number four. And then the fifth test of testing the spirits is, does it promote the love of God? That's in verses seven and eight. And we say the love of God, it's not only loving God, but the love of God in general. Uh, does it promote love of God and love of people? Uh, that's in verses seven and eight of of this passage that we're focused on. So again, quickly, the five tests for testing the spirit, the spirits, is one, does it teach the true Jesus? Two, is it against worldliness? Three, does it uphold God's word? Four, does it promote truth? And five, does it promote the love of God? And really, any teaching or teacher or whatever that uh, you cannot say yes to of any of these questions, there's a real problem. Um, and it's not like, uh, well, I got most of them. Uh, the idea is all, you know, the, the thing we're evaluating has to pass all five tests, all right, in order to really be from the Spirit of God. Let's look at the first test in a little more detail tonight, and that is in testing the spirits, all right, that, that teaching or person that comes along and says, this is what God says, this is what you should believe. Um, question number one, does it teach the true Jesus? That's... That's where we start. So again, look at verses two and three, uh, just to refresh our memory. 
By this you know the Spirit of God. Notice that phrase, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Just a little bit of the uh, first century background of, of this. You know, what was John concerned about in uh, these churches he was writing to in the first century? Um, there was an idea developing, and it uh, continued to develop and became even more influential later, after the time of the New Testament. But there were some people that had the idea that Jesus, uh, although he appeared to be a flesh and blood human being, wasn't actually, uh, that he was only spirit. Uh, he appeared to be human, but he wasn't. He, he only appeared to be so. And so John emphasizes, you know, uh, the true teacher says that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. He was flesh and blood. Uh, that's what the Bible teaches. That's what apostles like John taught. Uh, in fact, uh, a man like John knew it to be true. He, he walked and talked with Jesus for several years. He touched him. He saw him eat and sleep and so forth. They knew it to be true. He was real. But there came to be a time when it was a fashionable idea to say Jesus was only in appearance a man. He was actually uh, just spirit. There was reasons that that teaching developed, but won't go into those now, but sort of what John's responding to. And notice that he calls this idea, the spirit that teaches this, he calls it uh, the spirit of the Antichrist. Uh, Antichrist has always been a controversial um, idea in Christian circles, probably in the last, oh, nearly 100 years. Um, a lot of false ideas about the Antichrist, who's the Antichrist, um, and who can we identify to be the Antichrist, that kind of thing. And really, the, the question was answered in the first century by John. Um, John says that the Antichrist was already in the world when he wrote these words. And in fact, he says the one who goes around saying Jesus did not come in the flesh, that he wasn't really a man, this is Antichrist. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. And in other places, he will be more specific and call this the Antichrist. And in fact, he says there are many Antichrists um, at that time. Uh, so many false ideas about the Antichrist that some uh, great leader that comes at the end of time, one individual, that violates what John says. Uh, anyhow, um, this isn't really a study on that, but uh, just to show how important it is to teach what is true about Jesus. And that's our first test in testing the spirits. Does the teaching or teacher teach the true Jesus or some false form of Jesus? Uh, you know, the, the true spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, always directs attention to Jesus, centers attention on Jesus. The, the, the Spirit lifts up the Christ. And in fact, Jesus said that's what the Spirit would do. Um, a couple other texts back in the Gospels now in John chapter 14, we sort of uh, turned to some of these last time. Uh, on this night before Jesus was crucified, as he speaks to his disciples, prepares them, he talks about the one who is coming. Uh, he calls him the helper and so forth. But he's, he's referring to the Holy Spirit who he will send. And what was it that Jesus said of the coming of the Spirit? John chapter 14, verse 26, 
listen to how Jesus described him. Um, in this verse, he calls him the helper. So the Lord says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Notice what the Spirit is supposed to be doing, Jesus says. He's going to uh, teach them and remind them of what Jesus said. All right, that was the Spirit's job. He directs attention to Jesus. He does not call attention upon himself. The Spirit does not glorify himself. The Spirit does not uh, draw attention to himself. Always directs people to Jesus. And Jesus said that's what he would do. Two chapters later, John chapter 16, Jesus still speaking about this. And he says this in verse 13 of John 16. When the spirit of truth comes, notice how he refers to him, the spirit of truth. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Then very important for our purposes, verse 14, Jesus says of the spirit, he says, he will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Spirit always glorifies Jesus, lifts up Jesus, directs and showers attention upon Jesus. That is the role of the Spirit. Um, and an example of a kind of teaching we might want to question, that we might want to test, as John instructs us here, test the spirits to see if they're from God, is any teaching that puts more focus or emphasis on the Holy Spirit than on Jesus. So any uh, doctrine or teacher or maybe religious group that emphasizes the Spirit to the exclusion of Jesus, that focuses on the work of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, um, the signs of the Spirit, however it might be termed, uh, in a way that takes glory away from Jesus should automatically be suspect, you see. It really fails this first test. Uh, does it teach the true Jesus? Because Jesus himself said what the Spirit was going to do. It was going to teach and direct people to him. All right. Uh, one other place um, that he uh, reflects on this is in the chapter in between uh, in John chapter 15 and let's see verse 26 here again he calls the spirit the helper Jesus says but when the helper comes whom I will send to you from the father the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father he will bear witness about me. As I, as I read that verse, uh, there is so much in that one verse, you know, even outside of what we're talking about. Because in that verse, you have reference to God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son, because God the Son is speaking. You have uh, the Godhead completely in that verse. And one member of the Godhead, the Son, Jesus speaks and says, but when the helper, the spirit comes, whom I will send you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness about me. What does Jesus say the spirit's going to do? He is going to bear witness about me. He's going to tell truth because we're talking about true witnesses, not false witnesses. He's going to bear, uh, tell truth about Jesus. And then he goes on and he tells the disciples that he's speaking to in the, the last verse of that chapter, you also are going to bear witness um, because you've been with me from the beginning. And so then we have people like John 
um, whose words we're studying tonight in 1 John 4, who are doing that very thing. The Holy Spirit bears faithful witness to Jesus. So the first, and I think there's a reason it's the first test uh, that John gives us in 1 John 4, is Jesus-centered. Uh, when we're testing a spirit, that is uh, someone or something that claims to be true, uh, in a spiritual sense, a teaching, a teacher, a doctrine, a system of religion, whatever it might be. First thing we ask, does it teach the true Jesus? It could be teaching something about Jesus or some different version of Jesus. Like in the first century, some apparently were teaching that yeah, Jesus looked like he, he was a person a flesh and blood human being, but he wasn't really, he was just spirit. That's That fails test number one, you see, and shows it to be a false spirit. What do you do with a false spirit? You reject it, right? Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Jesus himself, as we saw last week, warned about this in his great sermon. Talked about false prophets who go about um, dressed to fool people, you know. So if something fails that first test and, and teaches a, an unbiblical view of Jesus, um, that is to be red flagged and, and really rejected right off. But that's just the first test. So it's almost like you have these filters, truth filters that John sets up for us here. And imagine dropping a, a teaching through these. Is it gonna make it through? Does it teach the true Jesus is the first one. And that one is really gonna strain out a lot of false teaching. But then also we're gonna have next time is it against worldliness? Uh, and and uh, we will see in verses four and five how important that is. And I think we could probably think in our minds of some teachings in our current time uh, purporting to be Christian, purporting to be of Jesus, which are clearly not against worldliness, that are in fact promoting worldliness. If that's the case, it needs to be rejected. It's a false spirit. Does it teach the true Jesus? Is it against worldliness? Number three, does it uphold God's word? Four, does it promote truth? And five, does it promote the love of God? That last one is important too. You might be able to meet some of the first tests and be totally unloving be totally unloving. And that is a false spirit that is not of God. Even if it says the right thing about Jesus, you see. Even if it upholds God's word, you can do that in an unloving way. And so, does it promote the love of God? Don't let, let that one seem unimportant just because it's number five is what I'm getting at. So we will look... Uh, at another one or two of these next week in more detail, sort of in the context of Scripture, as we talk about testing the spirits. Uh, again, we're, we're discussing John's command to test the spirits, um, not his command to have a testy spirit. There is a difference, and I hope that's clear to all of us tonight. Hope you have a great rest of your week. Looking forward to being able to assemble with one another Sunday and celebrate um, the resurrection of our Lord. And that's one of the great, great truths about him. Maybe the greatest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we call on your name knowing that you turn your ear to hear. Thank you for letting us be your children and being patient with us as we struggle in this world. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Help us to be willing to share it with others. Thank you for your son. We want to live for him and, and know more about him. Thank you for your spirit. 
who is our helper and help us to understand his work uh, in the world and in our lives. Pray your blessings on all those who are part of our study and those who aren't able to be right now. Please take care of them and keep them from the evil one. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.